morning, everybody. Um, this is Emily Walker, and we are so excited to have all of you on tonight. Uh, Dr. Matt Spangler with the University of Nebraska Lincoln is on, and he is going to delve in tonight, uh, really talking about how we can leverage uh, EPDs and indexes and um, and how we can make more profitable feedback cattle, maybe what you can do next year for your um, calves that are going into the SPC. So um, as a friendly reminder, do remember to take notes so you can submit your write-ups. You'll need to submit your write-ups to me no later than next Tuesday, January 10th. So um, after this, after Dr. Spangler gets done, um, you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. So if you have got any questions throughout the uh, presentation, just chat them to us. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see um, a chat button. So send them to me, and we will make sure that they get asked. So with that, Dr. Spengler, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for joining me here this evening. And I'd just like to say that I applaud you for being engaged in a, a program such as this. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about how to use expected progeny differences or EPDs and selection indices to try to produce more profitable feedlot cattle. I want to start with this picture because I think it's kind of a neat story. This, of course, is a, a purebred Angus animal who was the champion uh, Angus animal as a, a bull uh, in 1915. And a year later, he was the champion as a steer in 1916. So I'm sure that the majority of you don't have that same option to show as a, a mature bull one year, then go ahead and steer him and, and show him the next year. Uh, times have certainly changed in the past hundred years. But what this does illustrate is it would have been nice if these folks of close to a hundred years ago uh, could have somehow identified this guy as a young calf and made a decision um, based on data as to whether or not he should have been uh, should have remained as a bull or, or should have been steered and and maybe shown as a steer or sent to a feedlot. And so what we're going to talk about tonight are some of the tools that we can use to actually identify superior parents that can make offspring that are more profitable for us. So just some fundamentals. Here I have P equals G plus E. That stands for phenotype, or what we see, uh, is really uh, the sum of genetic effects represented by G and the environmental effects. And the environmental effects could be things such as the way we feed or manage the cattle, uh, the particular location at which they're fed because there are different um, environments in terms of temperature, in terms of uh, moisture, those kinds of things. So those things, genetics and environments, environment come together to create what we can visually see or visually measure. Another way of thinking about that is the phenotype, again, what we see is equal to some mean of a population. So for instance, Simmental cattle have a particular average for any given trait, let's say carcass weight. And that average then, um, we deviate that or can change it by the animal's genetic potential, here represented by BV or their breeding value, their value genetically as a parent plus the environment. Now, this really just contemplates or considers one trait at a time, but as you guys look at your, uh, pardon me, look at your summaries, uh, maybe every two weeks you're getting a feed bill. Uh, and if you think about what's really driving the value of that animal, it's more than one trait. So it's not just feed intake. It's feed intake plus gain, um, perhaps, plus some disease challenges. I hope you guys don't uh, run into anything like that. But there's a lot of traits that work together to determine how much money you make or how much money you lose. So I'm not an economist. Um, but I am confident that profit uh, is equal to revenue, so the, the money we get for the sale of an animal minus the cost of having gotten it to that point. Now, revenue, or how much we get for the sale of an animal, is fairly easy to measure. We sell cattle by the pound, and we know how much they weigh and how much they sell for, uh, for each pound. 
The cost, though, can oftentimes be much harder to measure, particularly as we think about evaluating uh, potential parents, be it sires or dams, so bulls or cows, uh, based on their genetic potential. I just wanted to show a, a, maybe a, a brief snapshot of the relative economic importance of different kinds of traits. So here I have reproduction, growth, and end product, and you can think about that as, as carcass. So there's been research work done that shows that for most beef cattle producers, uh, reproduction is 10 times as important as carcass. Uh, another way to look at this is reproduction is twice as important as growth, and growth is five times as important as carcass. Now, if you were an integrated operation, meaning that you actually own the animals all the way through the end product, so you're selling a product yourself in the grocery store or in a restaurant, this changes then. Then all of a sudden reproduction would only be twice as important as growth or twice as important as carcass. But this fits the majority of beef cattle producers. And if you think about it logically, it makes sense. If an animal can't get pregnant, then it really doesn't matter what their genetics are for growth or carcass because there's never a calf to sell. So now let's think of, of what is a relatively long list of traits that are important for what I call terminal sires. Those are bulls who are designed to produce calves that aren't going to be breeders. They're not going to be replacement females uh, for your herd. They're going to produce calves that are meant strictly to go to the feed yard, get fed out, and be harvested. So in choosing bulls for that kind of scenario, it's important for bulls to have superior genetics for calf survival because, again, dead calves don't make us money. Uh, they have to be good for male fertility. They have to be able to get cows bred. Disease susceptibility, uh, we like our calves not to be very susceptible to various diseases, for instance, bovine respiratory disease. Uh, what I call calving ease direct, that's how easily his calves are going to be born, particularly when they're bred to heifers. Uh, the growth rate, feed efficiency, and carcass quality and composition. And by that I mean really yield grade and quality grade. Now the traits that I have highlighted in blue are traits that the majority of beef breeds, uh, including Simmental, have EPDs for. Uh, the ones in black, some breeds have uh, either EPDs that directly measure this or they have uh, indicator traits. So if we think about something like male fertility, an indicator of that would be scrotal circumference. And then the ones highlighted in red are ones that, although we know are extremely important, we don't necessarily have expected progeny differences that directly measure these things. Now let's contrast that to the list of traits that are important if you're retaining your own replacement heifers. It's a completely different list of traits. So things like female fertility, maternal calving ease, how easily um, a female herself will give birth, uh, maintenance energy requirements, so how, many, uh, how much nutrients does a, a cow need just to maintain herself due to her mature cow weight and also her potential to milk. Longevity, how long can she stay productive in the herd? Uh, I have here maternal weaning weight, which often we call milk. Uh, and the reason why we call it maternal weaning weight uh, sometimes and not milk is because really the EPD for milk isn't in terms of pounds of milk. It's really in terms of pounds of weaning weight that we attribute to a cow's milking ability. I also have disease susceptibility here adaptation, how well does a cow do in the environment that we ask her uh, to live in. And I know that a lot of you are spread across the U.S. If you think about it, uh, the, the panhandle of Texas is a lot different environment than fescue country maybe that we find in, uh, in the south, southeast part of the U.S. So it's being adapted to that environment. And then, of course, the cow's temperament. And here again, I have traits highlighted in blue that we have EPDs for, 
and then the ones in red um, that although important, we don't. So it's a different list of traits depending on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to produce calves that are going to excel and make more money in the feed yard, or are you trying to produce animals that are going to make valuable replacement females? So it's important to clearly identify what your goals are before you try to choose a sire. How do you intend to market the calves? Are you going to sell them at weaning or do what you guys are doing now and actually retain them through the feedlot phase? Do you intend to keep your own replacement heifers or do you intend to purchase them? All of these kinds of things dictate which traits are important to you. And so after you identify those traits that we may call being economically relevant to you, that helps choose which bull that you should use in the future. So I mentioned economically relevant traits. Those are the traits that are directly associated with revenue, how much, how big the check is we get when we sell calves, or the cost, right? How much it costs to actually produce those animals. Those are economically relevant traits. So I know you're muted, but uh, I'm going to give you a little quiz and you can think about what the right answers are. Here a traditional example is birth weight versus calving ease. Which one of those is economically relevant? And I would argue that the economically relevant trait is calving ease. Birth weight is an indicator of that, but calving ease is the trait that's associated with the cost. If we have to ask a vet to come out and help um, the cow when she's giving birth, that has a cost to it. Birth weight is just simply an indicator of it. Another example is ribeye area versus yield grade. So although ribeye area is part of determining yield grade, yield grade is the thing that actually has uh, either slight premiums or discounts associated with it. So we would say that yield grade is the economically relevant trait. The next one's maybe a bit tricky, yearling weight or carcass weight. So for you guys, since you own uh, calves in the feed yard now, I'd say carcass weight is economically relevant because that's how they're going to be sold. But if I run a backgrounding operation uh, and I actually sell calves before they're finished, I sell them as yearlings, then yearling weight for me is economically relevant because that's the point at which I decide to sell them. And the last uh, question here is RFI, which is residual feed intake. That is the, the calculated difference between what we expect an animal to eat based on their size, what we think their maintenance requirements are, and their level of performance, how quickly they're gaining. We then calculate how much we think they would eat and then deviate that from how much they actually ate and we call that residual feed intake versus just feed intake alone, how much they actually eat. And you guys that are getting feed bills, I would assume um, normally we, we feed some cattle here, my wife and I, um, and we get feed bills every couple of weeks and we get billed based on how much the cattle ate. Not if they ate more or less than what we expected them to, we get billed for the whole amount that they ate. And because of that, I would say that feed intake by itself uh, is the economically relevant trait. So indicator traits are those things that are genetically related to an economically relevant trait, but itself is not economically relevant. So think back to birth weight versus calving ease. Birth weight there is the indicator trait of the thing that is economically relevant, which is calving ease. So why would we have indicator traits? Well, uh, sometimes they can be measured earlier in life, which gives us more time to make a decision of who we want to be parents. Uh, they could be cheaper or easier to measure, or in some cases we may be able to measure them on both bulls and heifers, um, when in some cases the, the economically relevant trait we could only measure on one of the sexes. So I think a nice example of an indicated trait that can be measured earlier in life and is cheaper and easier to measure is something like ultrasound. And I'm going to show you some images of carcass ultrasound here in a second. But before I do, I want to talk about different sources of information. 
And so one example is raw data. So for instance, how much the calf actually weighed at a year of age. So that is raw data. And what impacts that animal's phenotype, or in this case what they weighed at a year of age, is obviously their genetics, but also how we manage them up to that point. So how did we feed them? Are they a bull or a heifer or a steer? We know that bulls tend to weigh more than steers, and steers tend to weigh more than heifers. Are there differences in age? Older cattle tend to weigh more than younger cattle do. If we're thinking about a trait like weaning weight, the age of their dam or the age of their cow has an impact on that because we know that really young cows don't milk as heavily and as a consequence their calves can be somewhat at a disadvantage in terms of their raw weaning weight. Also the climate. Those of you that maybe live in North Dakota, on average the birth weight of your calves will be greater than those of you that live in South Texas. We know that in cold climates birth weights tend to increase and that's because the cow's blood flow tends to go to the core of her body and that calf then benefits from that and they tend to come out a little bit larger. So all these different things impact the phenotype or what we call the raw data. An example of some raw data we collect that's related to carcass is ultrasound. So ultrasound is an indicator of carcass traits and I'm showing here a genetic correlation of greater than 0.7 and really what that means is ultrasound tends to be a pretty good indicator of the actual carcass traits. And the majority of all breeds, uh, including Simmental, actually combine these two. So they collect ultrasound measurements on yearling bulls and heifers and then they use that information to generate the carcass EPDs that we'll visit about here in just a second. But first I'm going to show you actually some ultrasound images. So this is an image we may take from an animal uh, and from this we can actually measure the ribeye area uh, and in this case we could measure it either in square inches or in square centimeters but we could measure the area of the ribeye and we could also measure the twelfth rib fat thickness from this image. So obviously if we want to get carcass data on a bull, we really have three options. One, we can harvest that bull, hang him up, and measure his ribeye area, but if we do that, we're going to have a hard time being able to use him as a bull after that. The other thing we can do is we can breed him, get a lot of his offspring, send them to the feed yard, and wait till they're harvested and they have carcass data, but that takes a long time. The other option is, is that we can actually measure via ultrasound his carcass attributes when he's roughly a year of age. This next image is an image where we can actually get what we call intramuscular fat percentage. That's the percentage of fat actually in the loin. And we can relate that then to their genetic potential for marbling. So we take images along the loin and then we can measure really the proportion of white in this picture is really related to fat. And at the bottom you'll see three in this picture um, kind of uh, dark protruding objects going up and down. Um, those are actually the animal's ribs. So we're taking this image going across the ribs and looking at the amount of fat contained in the loin. We take these kind of data and we adjust them. And we adjust them for things like sex, age and if appropriate for the trait age of dam and we make those adjustments so that we can begin to compare apples to apples so that we're not giving animals advantages simply because maybe they were older or simply because their dam was in a more productive part of her life or things of that nature and we can then take those adjusted records and form what we call ratios Ratios are a way of comparing animals within the same contemporary group. And a contemporary group is a group of animals that are all managed together. So you can think of it as a group of animals born in the same herd, in the same year, in the same season, and fed and managed the same way. Now, where some people make a mistake is they may 
take out uh, a couple of what they consider to be elite bull calves or elite heifer calves that they're going to show. Once they do that, they have made a different contemporary group for those animals because they're probably going to treat them a little bit differently than they do the rest of the group. So it's critical to know what a contemporary group is, and it's a group of animals really managed the same way. Here if we use the example of weaning weight again, let's say the average of that contemporary group is 500 pounds, and one particular animal in that group weighed 550 pounds. We can get then the ratio by simply taking the individual animal's adjusted weaning weight and dividing it by the group's average and then multiplying it by 100. So in this case, we'd say that animal for the trade of weaning weight ratioed 110. So a ratio of 100 says average, a ratio of greater than 100 says higher than average, and consequently a ratio of less than 100 says less than average. And depending on the trait, uh, we may want a higher or lower ratio. These are fine with com for comparing animals within the same contemporary group, uh, but certainly you cannot use them to compare individuals across contemporary groups. So uh, certainly not across herds, across years, uh, those kinds of things, because those different uh, influencers like herd and year have different environmental influences, and so the group averages simply may not be the same. So if we want to compare animals across various contemporary groups, what we have to use are what we call EPDs, or expected progeny differences. So what's included in these? Well, the animal's pedigree information. So information from the animal's parents, uh, their full siblings, their half siblings, their cousins, any animal that's related to them. Also, the individual's own records, so for instance, their own ultrasound data or their own yearling weights are included in these. And once they become a parent, the information from their offspring or for them, from their calves is also included in it. The nice thing about EPDs is that it focuses solely on the genetic merit of an individual because we've taken out those environmental influences through all the adjustments that we just talked about. So if I'm wanting to select the next bull that I'm going to use, I want to select him based on his genetic potential because that's the only thing that he's going to pass on to his calves or his genetics. So here's just a real simple example so that we are all on the same page relative to how EPDs work. So I have two bulls here, bull A and bull B. Both of them have birth weight EPDs. Bull A has a birth weight EPD of 3 and bull B has a birth weight EPD of negative 1. So what we could say is, on average, we expect calves sired by bull B to be 4 pounds lighter at birth than those sired by bull A. I just simply took the difference or subtracted 3 from negative 1 and that gives me 4. The reason I say on average is not every calf uh, sired by bull A is going to be lighter than every calf sired by bull B. There's going to be variation. But over enough calves, on average, we would expect this difference of four pounds to hold true. These EPDs are associated with accuracy values. So the accuracy of an EPD tells us how close that EPD is to the animal's true genetic potential as a parent. So you can think about it as a way of quantifying risk. A young bull that we know very little about is going to have a relatively low accuracy. But a heavily used AI sire that has a lot of offspring all across the country, we're going to have a lot of information about him, and as a consequence, his accuracy value will be higher. Accuracy values can range between 0 and 1, although they're really never 0. We always know a little bit and they're never one. We never have a perfect idea. Uh, but for a heavily used AI sire, certainly it could be greater than 0.9, and for a young yearling bull, it may be, depending on the trait, closer to 0.2 or 0.3. So here's a completely made up uh, scenario of a, 
maybe what you might see in a, a sale catalog. We've got a, a picture of a bull here. This could be a, a Simangus bull calf that's for sale. And of course, we have the little descriptor next to the picture uh, that I, the seller, would say. I tell you how great he is um, and that he's homozygous black and homozygous polled and uh, that I did some genomic testing and we'll talk about that here in a little bit and I tell you what his score is for a, a trait called tenderness basically uh, how tender the meat would be and then I've got all kinds of information for different traits like calving ease direct or CED uh, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight uh, maternal calving ease, milk, tenderness, yield grade, marbling, back fat, ribeye area, and then these things over here which are, are uh, the particular ones I've pointed out are unique to Simmental, but these are indexes, uh, API or Simmental's All-Purpose Index and TI, Simmental's Terminal Index, and we'll talk about those later. The challenge is for any of you that have gone through bull sale catalogs or AI catalogs, there's a lot of data there, a lot of stuff to try to sort through and make sense of because for all these traits, I may actually have adjusted measurements, ratios, EPDs, the accuracy of those EPDs, etc. And so it becomes hard to know what to use. That's why it's important to determine what your objective is, how you sell those calves because that tells you what traits are important. After you've determined that, then based on what we've talked about, I'd encourage you to use the EPDs or expected progeny differences because those measure the genetic potential of an animal. Two bits of information we haven't talked about yet are, are these indexes and we'll go over why those can actually be helpful in making some of these complex decisions sorting through all this information and choosing which sire to use. Before I do that though I want to talk about ways that we can increase the accuracy of EPDs on very young animals and one way to do that is through DNA. So we can actually get DNA on an animal and some of you may have done this and I think uh, through this this project you'll you'll actually uh, maybe at least get samples taken but you can actually get it through the, the hair follicles, the hair roots, and we can actually pull tail hair to do that uh, through blood, if it's a bull, through semen. Uh, we can take a little ear notch and get it through tissue, or we can even get it through saliva in some cases. And so a lot of different ways to get DNA. But what this allows us to do is to get a little bit of a glimpse into the genetic potential of a very young animal and because we can do that, we can increase the accuracy of the EPDs. And so really we can do this at birth. And actually, interestingly, in some cases, and this is becoming quite popular in the dairy industry, they actually do it before the calf's even born. So they can actually get DNA uh, while the calf's still in the cow and do some of these tests to determine how genetically superior or inferior that animal will be. So a lot of different applications of this DNA technology. Uh, one, I've got the picture here of the mom and dad and the little girl getting her mouth swabbed. Uh, so parentage testing that's used in humans is the same thing that we use in livestock, being able to determine who the true parents are of an individual. And for seed stock producers, that allows us to ensure that the pedigree is actually correct. If you look in the upper left hand here, we have a picture of a a dead calf, this is actually a genetic defect known to influence uh, Red Angus and Red Angus composite cattle called marble bone and uh, it causes calves to be born dead. Uh, but luckily a lot of these genetic defects now we have DNA tests to be able to identify the animals uh, that perhaps are carrying those lethal genetic defects. So I want to think about traits that are simply inherited right now. Those are traits that are controlled only by one gene. And so if you think about the genetic defect that I just talked about, um, we could see here on the top I have big A, little a, and we'll say that the little a is the allele or the form of the gene that actually causes that bad phenotype, causes that particular genetic disease where the calf is actually born dead. So this big A, little a animal is what we would call a carrier 
or more specifically, we call that animal heterozygous. Then if we look down the left hand side, we have a big A, big A. This would be a, a homozygous normal animal. Okay? It doesn't carry the recessive genetic defect. Now, let's assume that we make these two animals. We make this carrier with the animal that is homozygous normal. What we find is, is that 50% of the time through that mating, we'll get animals that are also homozygous normal or big A, big A. Half the time, we'll get animals that themselves are carriers. They're big A, little a. But from this mating, we will never get an animal that has this genetic disease. Never. And that's the benefit of genomic testing or using DNA to find these things because let's assume this carrier animal, the big A, little a animal, was actually genetically superior for all the traits we were looking for. If we actually knew that the animal was a carrier, we could use them appropriately in our breeding program and never have a problem. Now, particularly if all of these offspring were going to be sent to the feed yard to feed out, we have no worries. If, however, we are going to keep some of them to be future cows, we're going to retain some of the heifers, then we have to realize that we may have to do some further genetic testing to make sure that we never mate uh, two potential carriers together. If we do, then we have about a 25% chance that we could wind up, uh, in this case, with a calf that has that marble bone disease or is born dead. Another neat thing we can do with DNA is actually tracing products. So we can tell which animal this steak came from. And that's something that's not commonly done here in the U.S. right now. But I think it's something, particularly given how young you guys are, certainly uh, as you become engaged in the beef industry here in the U.S., that's something we may hear more about. Because the fact is, consumers like to know as much as possible about where their food came from. And we can actually use DNA technology to help us do this. The process, uh, here I have a picture of somebody collecting hair follicles and putting it on a, uh, a little card. And then those cards can get sent to a place like GeneSeq, which is here in Lincoln, Nebraska, that actually does the genotyping and then provides the results uh, to the producer or if you do it through your breed association, provides it to somebody like American Simmental Association who then provides that information to their members. I mentioned early on a trait that might be important if you're feeding out your own cattle and that's feed efficiency. And it's unfortunately a trait that's a little bit hard to get at because to be able to get that kind of data, we need to be able to measure how much an individual animal eats on a daily basis. So we can't really use pen averages to do that. We need to know how much the individual animal ate and how much the individual animal gained. And so this is a website of a very large project funded by the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, which focuses on that very thing. And I'll show you just a, a few results from that. And here it just shows two breeds, Angus and Hereford. Uh, and we used in, in this part of the project uh, 1,579 Angus animals and 847 Hereford animals. I'll tell you, though, as part of this project, we actually did involve a lot of Simmental and Sim Angus cattle. But I, what I want to point your attention to is we genotyped these animals with over 770,000 DNA markers. So that is a lot of DNA markers uh, for each individual animal. And we asked the question, how much of the differences in feed intake can we explain by using those DNA markers? So here I have dry matter intake, or DMI, and if we look at this funny symbol I have here that's H squared. That's the heritability of the trait. That tells us how much of the differences in dry matter intake are due to genetic differences. And what we see is, is that we're able to explain for dry matter intake in Angus, 35% of the differences in dry matter intake between animals 
using this very powerful DNA marker tool. And in Hereford, that number was about 41%. So what this told us is that we could actually use DNA technology to help us decide which animals are actually genetically superior for things like feed intake or feed efficiency. Another thing I wanted to show you that's very much related to the consumer is that we can also use this DNA technology to help us decide which animals are actually superior for certain health attributes of the beef. So for instance, which ones genetically will have less cholesterol or less saturated fatty acids, or in this case, more iron. Those things are under genetic control. And this was a project a former graduate student of mine performed, and we found that really the heritability of iron content in beef was about 35%, which is fairly similar to what we see for traits like uh, birth weight or weaning weight or yearling weight. Now this particular graph that I'm showing you is called a Manhattan plot. And the reason it's called a Manhattan plot is you see all these little peaks. And these peaks are meant to look like the skyline of Manhattan, New York. Those of you from the Midwest may think of Manhattan as Manhattan, Kansas. I've been there and that skyline is relatively flat. So these kind of graphs aren't meant to represent Manhattan, Kansas. But what each one of these little dots are, are a DNA marker. And the higher the dot is on the graph, the more important that DNA marker is at explaining differences between animals for the trait, in this case, iron content in beef. So while this isn't something that we use right now, these traits, iron content or fatty acids, aren't something that we currently select cattle for, it is something that we could select cattle for. And if there were niche markets that demanded it, you as beef cattle producers can utilize these tools to help change it. All right, I mentioned before that you're tasked with selecting animals and trying to improve profit. And to improve profit means that you have to change multiple traits at the same time. And there's really three different ways to do that. The first one is called tandem selection. What that says is, is that I'm going to start off on day one selecting to increase, let's say, hot carcass weight. And I'm going to select on it until I get it where I want it, and then I'm going to stop, and I'm going to select on the next trait that's important to me, and maybe that's marbling. And I'm going to select on it until I get it where I want it, and then I'm going to stop and select on something different. The problem with that is, is that it takes a long time and you're really selecting only on one trait at a time. And if those traits are related to each other, it's possible that once you move on to the next trait, you could kind of erode or lose some of the progress you made in the first trait. The other way to select for multiple traits at the same time is what we call independent culling levels. What that means is probably what a lot of you guys do, and it's what a lot of beef cattle producers do. They sit down and come up with thresholds for every single trait. So they say, I'm not going to buy a bull unless his birth weight EPD is, let's say, 2.0 or less. And his weaning weight EPD has to be 60 or higher. And his ribeye area EPD has to be 0.6 or higher. And they set all these thresholds for all these traits and they say, if a bull misses my threshold for one trait, I'm going to ignore him. The problem with that is, one, we tend to cheat. If we fall in love with a bull, we change our threshold. But the bigger problem is, is that it's possible that in doing that, we actually miss the bull who in total could be the most profitable for our operation. And so the preferred way to do this is to use selection indices. So a selection index, for instance, Simmental's terminal index, is a way to combine a lot of EPDs into simply one number and to weight each one of the traits proportional to how much they influence profit. And this method, method was actually first developed in the 1940s, so a long, long time ago. 
This is a quote from a relatively famous uh, animal breeder or geneticist, Rick Borden, and he's talking about why we need selection indices. And he said there's no easily accessible, objective way for breeders, particularly in the beef and sheep industries where ownership is diverse and production environments vary a great deal, to use these predictions intelligently. What he's saying is, is that as beef cattle producers, we all have slightly different goals. We raise cattle in slightly different environments, in some cases, big differences in environments. And so it's really hard for us to use the big group of EPDs we have, and that's what he means by these predictions, the EPDs. It's hard for us to use those in the correct fashion. And so what he was advocating for here is, is that we need to use these selection indexes. So here's the beginning of, a, of an example of how we may uh, uh, use those. So if we look on the right-hand side, we have the things that we really want to change, that we know that impact profit, like calf survival, uh, dry matter intake, that's feed intake, yield grade, quality grade, hot carcass weight, and disease tolerance. Those are the things that are going to impact how profitable your calves are in the feed yard. But maybe the EPDs that we have to change those things differ slightly. Maybe we have an EPD for carcass weight, for yield grade, for marbling, and maybe calving ease direct because maybe we argue that's somewhat related uh, to a calf being able to survive uh, maybe the first few hours of his or her life. So we don't have an EPD for disease and we may or may not have an EPD for feed intake. So we have to use the EPDs that we actually have and their genetic relationship with the traits that we actually wish to change. And this is a long list of the EPDs, or pardon me, the indexes that are available in the U.S. cattle industry. And so you'll see for uh, Simmental, the terminal index, the one designed to make calves uh, going to the feed yard, we have their terminal index. And if you retain replacement heifers, the index to use for Simmental would be API or the all-purpose index. So it's important when using these indexes to use the one that actually fits what you're trying to do. Right, here's an example of two bulls that have terminal index values. The first bull has an index value of 90, and the second bull has an index value of 66. So there's a a difference of 24 between them. And that difference means $24 per calf that they produce. So if we assume that we're going to take those bulls and we're going to make them each to 30 cows a year and we're going to keep them for four years. So we could assume that those bulls are going to be exposed to about 120 cows over their lifetime. So if we take that number of exposures and multiply it by the difference in these two bulls index values, 90 minus 66, we come up with an estimate of close to $2,900. And that really is the amount of profit or the additional profit we expect to get from having used bull A as compared to having used bull B. So these index values can be very useful tools at determining which bull actually holds more profit potential for your particular operation. I'll write another quick example of indexes here. Um, this is from some research work done here at the University of Nebraska a few years ago now, looking at different ways to select and improve feed efficiency. And this particular student really looked at seven different ways. One, selecting to decrease feed intake, selecting to increase gain, selecting to increase uh, gain to feed ratio, okay, the pounds of gain we get from the pounds of feed, um, and then four different index values. And what we see over here under the columns dry matter intake and gain is the response or the change we would expect from having selected on these seven different tools. And what I want to just quickly point out is that one of these indexes, index three here, allowed us to decrease feed intake and at the same time increase gain. 
And that's unexpected because we expect as an animal gains more, they eat more. Those two things are fairly strongly genetically correlated, but the genetic correlation isn't one, meaning that we can select for animals that eat less but still gain more. And so what that index is, this is uh, what the four indexes were. This is uh, the phenotype of residual feed intake was index one. The second one was an EPD for residual feed intake. And the third one, which I said was the best, was an index, an economic index that included feed intake and gain. And so that's what a lot of our indexes include now. Uh, they include feed intake, gain, and then the appropriate carcass measurements. So how do we make sense of all this? Well, it's identifying those traits that are economically relevant for you and understanding the different sources of information and knowing that EPDs and economic index values are certainly more valuable at choosing your next bull than the actual records or ratios themselves. And EPDs have been shown to be between seven and nine times more effective at actually making change in the trait than the actual measurements themselves. It's also, as young cattle producers, important to establish your production goals. How are you going to sell your calves? Are you going to retain replacement efforts? Those critical things. And use the economic indexes that we discussed that really fit what your production goals are. You don't need to make sire selection or bull buying more complicated than it really needs to be. These tools are there to help you make it easier. So with that, I'm going to close by showing what I consider to be some helpful resources here. The first ones are UNL Beef Production uh, webpage, which has beef cattle information, not just genetics, but nutrition and reproduction and management. I showed this one before, beefefficiency.org. That's the website that discusses genomics and feed efficiency. And the last two are websites that uh, have genetic uh, education material meant for producers and uh, extension personnel. So I encourage you guys to take a look at those. And uh, if you have any questions once you do, any feedback, I'm more than happy to listen to that. And hopefully you can help us make those resources better. So with that, uh, hopefully we have time for a few questions, if there are any. And I'll turn it back over to you. OK, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Spengler. I've got um, a couple of questions here. And for those of you um, that are listening in, I can see there's quite a few of you tonight. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a chat box. So if you've got any questions, please chat them to me, and I will um, relay them to Dr. Spengler to answer. In the meantime, um, I do have a question. Um, that comes from us on staff. Um, how do you see um, things like iron content and the nutritional profile of beef being incorporated into genetic selection indexes? Do you predict that one day we will have a nutritional value EPD? No, I think that's a good question. So I think what has to happen first is there has to be what I'd call a market signal whereby producers could actually get paid premiums or could be discounts for differences in those kinds of traits. If that were to happen, uh, then I think it would make sense to include those kinds of EPDs into something like PI. But until then, until there's uh, a direct um, a revenue stream, you know, a, a premium for that, I, I simply don't think that's possible. The, the same could be true for something like tenderness. I, I think we all agree that consumers like more tender beef. I know I do. Um, but producers don't get paid for that. So it makes it much harder to come up with how economically important it is and to put it into an index. Well, I know you like. Dr. Spangler, I'm not sure. Can can you hear us at this point? Yep, I can. 
It's awesome. This is Chip. I, I know Emily's having some audio troubles, and so uh, Emily, if you can if you can hear, step back in. Okay. Um, so Jackie, I'm not sure if you're able to see the the young folks' their questions. I do know though, in the interim while they're working on that audio, uh, Dr. Spangler wanted to follow up with an additional question, maybe along those same lines. Um, Carbon footprint EPD. Do you see something like that as maybe falling in a similar realm of what you just spoke about, or do you see other forces as maybe driving us down that road at some point? Um, so, yeah. I, I, again, I, I think that's possible. Um, I think where that comes into play is is again there being some kind of clear signal, whether it be uh, directly from the consumer or um, whether it be from a, a governmental agency that provides essentially carbon credits. And, and then I think um, it would be possible to put that kind of thing into indexes. I'd say, though, that we do have indicators of that already, things that, um, for instance, dry matter intake, uh, gain, uh, mature cow weight, all the things that we know um, influence the number of days on feed or how much feed an animal needs, um, I think some of those tools could be used to get at that if we ever were to get to that point. So, so an additional question, since I, I, I think there's still some struggle on the other side. So is these young folks that are listening um, certainly are thinking really hard about which selection tools to use from a genetic standpoint. Can you give them a sense of, of how much they personally or when their own families are working with maybe potential bull buyers or heifer buyers, how much should they weight the indexes versus the traditional EPDs in your view in their day-to-day -day work? I, so uh, I'm sure it, it sounds to the folks listening like a canned answer, but um, I think outside of some specialized circumstances, uh, I would I would weight the indexes extremely heavily. And the only specialized circumstances would be, for instance, if they're in a, a very harsh environment or feed very limited, um, and they maybe worry about milk EPDs because we know that cattle that milk too much when feed is limited, they have the uh, a greater chance of coming up open. And, uh, and so in that case, they may select uh, bulls to make replacement females based off of API, um, but they may do it only within what they consider to be an acceptable window for milk EPD. So I think that's a case where using indexes and EPDs together makes sense. Outside of that, um, I find it hard to think about uh, scenarios where indexes wouldn't be a priority for me. But again, it's it's important to realize um, how those indexes should be used. I wouldn't I wouldn't select bulls based strictly off of TI uh, if I intended to keep back replacement heifers because TI doesn't have any any maternal traits in it. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a question from one of the from one of the juniors listening. Uh, Ty Jones, it's a little shout out to you, Adi. Um, question from Ty is: Do you see a time in the future where regionalized EPDs will take a greater hold? Uh, I don't, um, and I, and I say that hoping that they don't. Uh, those uh, assuming that that most people on here are between the ages of eight and twenty one. Uh, they don't remember a time when national cattle evaluation or the, the, the framework that developed EPDs first started. Um, but I think we've migrated now to the point where we can actually use data uh, from across the U.S. And the benefit of that is that we can actually get sires that have much higher accuracy values because they're producing calves, a, a lot more calves. If we do it regionalized, the amount of information we're going to have to actually rank sires becomes quite limited. Um, 
the reason why people may be interested in that is, is the thought that there's what we call genetic by environment interactions, that some animals genetically uh, excel in some environments uh, but don't really excel in, in other environments. And there's really fairly limited examples of that being a, a severe problem in beef cattle. There's been a lot of work in that area, but relatively limited of examples of, of animals actually re-ranking uh, when, we, when we think about that. And the reason is, is because there are, are thousands of genes that impact any one trait. And so while some genes, for instance, may be very important or for cattle grazing in, in fescue country, for example, um, there's a lot of other genes that maybe uh, are important in different parts of the country and so in, in total they begin to average themselves out because no, no one of those genes is going to be really the driver uh, for whatever trait we're looking at. So I, I don't see us moving uh, towards a, a regionalized system and I, I think in a lot of cases that would be a mistake because of all the information we lose out on. Dr. Spangler, didn't come from Great. the junior Great. by chance, Chip, and they want to follow up on that discussion. I'm more than happy to. They can feel free to email me. Awesome, tremendous. Okay. Um, oh, take that. I think we have another question. Did I hear Emily? Oh, this was Emily. I was just going to add on um, that there was no more questions. So thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Spangler, and for those of you that are on. We've got a couple of quick updates from the beef yard um, here to end the call tonight. But thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you all learned a lot. All right. Well, my, my pleasure, guys. Okay. Um, just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Oh. Oh, I think we lost Emily. Yep. Um, Jackie, is... you, I'll let you take those questions, Jackie. Uh, all right, I'll just hop on. Sorry, we've had a little bit of audio problem here tonight, but um, just wanted to um, thank Dr. Spangler, Spangler for a great talk, and um, he directed you to a couple of resources there at the end of his talk, and just to um, add to that, uh, the eBeef um, website, I highly recommend folks going there. Um, it, uh, it's got a lot of like two minute videos, links, links to YouTube videos that are short and sweet on, you know, um, why you see, uh, EPDs change, um, how genomics get incorporated, a lot of like basic, um, questions that you might have on, on animal breeding and genetics have been answered on that EB site. They've got fact sheets. You can sign up for a newsletter. Um, also, the, the UNL uh, beef site is a great uh, spot for, for some help in, in various educational efforts. And they also have a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, that's full of a lot of um, wonderful information. So I highly recommend um, uh, Heading that, um, heading to those sites for for additional information. I wanted to give just a quick update on our DNA project. We've got samples in on all the calves, so thank you to everybody for sending in those samples. Uh, we have not sent them to GeneSeq yet, just because it's a little out of our protocol and GeneSeq's protocol. We had to um, navigate those waters and find the best way. You know, GNC gets hundreds of thousands of samples in monthly. So we wanted to figure out um, the best way to tag those because they're being paid by GNC and not confusing sample reception and whatnot. So I think we've got that figured out and should be able to send those in um, this week or next week at the latest. Um, and also, just a reminder, um, from the feed yard, again, Emily's, I think, having some audio problems, but 
just a friendly reminder to pay your bill. Uh, there's a few folks that that need to send in their bill um, sooner rather than later for their check. Uh, so if you haven't done that yet, please do so. They've really gone out of their way to help us uh, make this competition even an option. And so please uh, be respectful of, of what they've done for us and, and pay your feed bill. Um, the other thing Emily had mentioned is that she's actually going to be in chapel, I think that's next week, uh, ahead of the stock show. And so she's planning to go to the feed yard and take pictures of all the calves. And so we all should be uh, seeing some updated pictures here in the next couple of weeks. So that should be fun. And otherwise, I don't know that we have any updates. I don't know if Chip, if you have any updates um, on the calves or on the yard. Uh, if not, the let me just pull up my calendar here. Uh, the next um, webinar will be the 7th of February. Um, and don't forget to send in your summaries um, from Dr. Spangler's talk by the 10th of January. Send those to Emily. And um, so far, I've, I've read through uh, quite a few of these and just really think you guys are um, doing a great job of peeling out information from these topics that can be kind of hard to digest and, and so keep up the good work. And unless there's any other questions, I think we'll, um, we'll end the show for the evening. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you all.